Hello, everybody, Bye. and welcome to the second Armchair Travel Tour of 2024. It's lovely to see you all this evening. This event is hosted by Peter Summer Travels, who is the newest tour operator on the programme. I'm also delighted to introduce and welcome this evening's talk speaker, Professor Jim uh, Jim Crow, who is works at the uh, University of Edinburgh and an all-round expert on this evening's topic of Hadrian's Wall. Just to remind you all, all the armchair travel events are recorded, including this evening's event, so if you've missed any of the previous talks, please visit the Cambridge Alumni website where you can find um, them all on the event player. I would now like to hand over to Peter from Peter Summer Travels. Hello everyone, um, my name is Peter Sommer. Um, I'm originally an archaeologist and a uh, documentary maker. Um, I run, along with my wife, a, a specialist travel company called Peter Sommer Travels. Um, we've been going for 22 years and uh, we specialise in small group expert-led archaeological and cultural tours. Um, quick little message about my background. Uh, 30 years ago, next month, I walked 2,000 miles across Turkey um, from Troy, retracing the route of Alexander the Great, uh, a rather madcap adventure, but it sparked a uh, love for Turkey and travel, and um, that gave rise to the travel company that um, I now own and run. What do we do? We take people on small group tours. Um, here's a little group walking down one of the main streets at Ephesus in Turkey. Uh, we are the leading company that specializes in cultural gulet cruises. Those are the traditional wooden boats that are handcrafted in Turkey. And now we do gulet cruises in Croatia, Greece uh, and Turkey, um, all with expert guides, archaeologists on board so you can uh, explore the islands, the uh, various sections of coastline. Um, here's Knidos um, in southwest Turkey, fantastic ancient theatre and uh, one of our goulets just, just out um, offshore. Uh, and one of our favourite tours, of course, is led by um, Jim Crow, who you're going to hear from shortly. Um, this is one of our groups in uh, a mile castle on one of the most dramatic sections of Hadrian's Wall up on the wind sill. Uh, the group size is a maximum of 18. This is one of the restored forts uh, South Shields uh, where we'll be visiting. You can join us this uh, this summer, July, July the 16th and uh, to the 13th, um, led by Professor Jim Crow. And uh, I will now hand over to you, Jim. Thanks very much, Peter. What has it gone? Wrong one. There it is. Right, can you all see that now? Is that fine? Good. We, well, no, Jim, we can't see anything at the moment. You, Jim. you can see me. You can't see anything. Uh, some mm. of it. Uh, let's go back to the Zoom. Oh, gosh. Zoom. Where's he gone? Oh, we did it before. Oh, sorry. Can you see it now? No, Hello? Still, still just you, Jim. <laughs> That's no good. You're very nice to look at. No, I'm not. Let me shut everything down. I've got too many windows open. Now that. I can't do that because that will right, do that. So why can't it? I did it before. Apologies for everybody. Okay. Hang on, it's coming up. Yeah, now you yeah. need to go to full screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do that bit. <laughs> it's just getting it. Yes. Get it. Get there we it, are. Everybody. Right. 
let's just hide myself. That's better. Okay. Um, apologies, everybody. Just let me just get my laser pointer. That's it. Good. There we are. Right. Apologies. Um, thank you very much, Peter, for the introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about Hagen's Wall, which I enjoy doing. Um, and what I'm going to try and do over the next uh, 45 minutes is, uh, you know, give you, give some of you an introduction, raise some of the key questions. And um, so I hope you have a slightly better, a better understanding and raise some particular sort of, I think, relevant issues of how we understand the war and how this has changed through time. Um, as Peter showed you before, actually, he showed you the Mile Castle, which I excavated in the 1980s. That's Mile Castle 39. This is slightly to the, <clears throat> excuse me, this is slightly to the west, uh, looking across onto, uh, in the far distance is Sewing Shields Crags. Um, but this is one of the uh, sort of iconic views of the wall. Uh, the wall running away, the crags. And of course, much of the length of Hadrian's Wall from coast to coast isn't like this at all. Um, brief historical uh, introduction. Uh, the Romans had invaded uh, what we now term Northern Britain as Scotland uh, in the 70s under Agricola, uh, and they'd established forts, which you can see there on the left, north of the Firth of Forth up towards the Highland Line, including an in at Inch Toothville, a legionary fortress. But this occupation lasted a relatively few years, and the areas to the north of the Forth uh, and the central belt of Scotland were abandoned, and uh, Roman presence was withdrawn into the borders, particularly around Newstead in the basin of the Tweed, uh, with connections further to the north. Uh, and then by the time of, of Trajan, around 100 AD, um, the Romans probably still occupied some of this area, but had also withdrawn onto the line of the Tyne-Solway Isthmus, basically between Newcastle and Carlisle. And the map on the right shows you effectively uh, Newcastle, there's Wall's End, the fort at Wall's End, over in the east, and Carlisle to the west. Um, now, I won't say a great deal about this period because I think it's quite controversial and there are a lot of uh, assumptions made. Um, but at the same time, there are many scholars who consider that at this period, around about 100 to 120, which is the time when Vindolanda, for instance, is occupied and the date from which the Vindolanda writing tablets derived, they're before Hadrian's Wall, that there was a frontier line established what is known as the Stain Gate. Oh, what is clear on the map on the right is that what I've marked with those um, yellow hexagons are the two legionary fortresses, one at York and one down towards the southwest at Chester. Um, and it's interesting that between there and Hadrian's Wall, or whatever we call it, the, the Stangate line, uh, was an area which the Romans maintained as essentially a military zone. Not entirely but essentially a military zone, uh, certainly in the first and second centuries and to a lesser degree in the third. Now, this is a more detailed view of Hadrian's Wall, of the line of Hadrian's Wall itself. So there's Wall's End at the <laughs> eastern end um, and Stanix, which is the great uh, cavalry fort there. Um, and then beyond that, as far as Bowness and Solway, we also must remember there's a line of towers and small forts, akin to what we find on Hadrian's Ward and the turrets and mark castles, continued along the coast of Cumberland down towards Maryport, and then forts which went down beyond that, potentially um, monitoring the presence of those coming across the Solway from southwestern Scotland or potentially from Ireland. Um, I won't be saying anything about those today. I'll be I'll be focusing in what time we have available on the wall itself. But here also you can see what we know of the road system. And here I'm talking about the major roads, not the, the road that actually ran immediately behind the, road, the wall linking the forts, which we call the military way. And I'll show you that a little later. But this is the line of the main road coming up from, uh, from York, which then went through the wall just to the west of Halton Chester's and continues up towards 
into uh, Reedstone, Northumberland, up towards Carterbar in Scotland. That's the modern A68. The other road that's significant is this road here, which runs from Corbridge, Corrier, marks as Corrier, and then crosses the Tyne, and then runs towards Vindolanda, and then on past a series of smaller forts, including Carvoran. So both of those two forts were there before Hadrian's Wall was constructed, and then towards um, Carlisle. So that's the Stane Gate. And as I say, many scholars see that as a, a, an interim frontier line. I'm not convinced because I don't see this line extending, uh, well, there's no evidence that it extended anywhere to the east of Corbridge, Corrier. Um, so this whole zone is without anything. And there are various new or old suggestions which have been reinvented uh, recently to try and um, try and get around that particular uh, issue. It's important to realize that Hadrian's Wall, or certainly the Roman Wall, was never forgotten. Um, both Gildas and Nennius, and then Bede, write about the Roman Wall. Whether they got it right or not, as the way we understand it, is another matter. But they certainly knew there was a stone wall which crossed the isthmus. And in fact, you can see in this map of Matthew and Paris in the middle of the 13th century that no, there were not just two walls, but there was another wall. Because, of course, Latin texts talk not just only of this wall, but also another wall of uh, the wall of Antoninus Pius. Um, and and we have texts we have texts like this medieval text which says you know the famous that famous wall, and a particularly interesting account uh, early in the 16th century, um, actually before many of the this is a Scottish account by a Scottish humanist who was the principal of King's College in Aberdeen, um, and I will not attempt to try and um, I you know although I have been in Scotland although I live now in Berwick on Tweed. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce this, but it's basically Hadrian built a huge wall um, from the mouth of the Tyne. Um, and there's, you know, a clear evidence of a recognition of the presence of this wall in the 16th century. Now, serious antiquary, antiquarian uh, understanding of the wall emerges in the late 16th century with the man on the left, William Camden, um, in the reign of Elizabeth and then of James VI and James I uh, in the early 17th century. Camden, of course, wrote his great work on the history and archaeology, early history and archaeology of Britain, of Britannia, um, which was originally in Latin in various editions, and then later on translated into English. And in that, um, he includes an account of the Roman Wall. And he visited the Roman Wall in many places, but was not able to visit the Roman wall in the central sector, the parts we've seen, the, you know, the sort of the great crags, because it was uh, it was basically unsafe. It was an insecure area full of brigands uh, around Housteads and, 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 and so on. The second person who I think is really important in our understanding and developing um, a, um, a structured um, account of the wall I don't have a photograph. I don't have a, a, an illustration of him. And this is John Horsley. John Horsley was um, a native of Newcastle, but because he was a nonconformist, he went to university in Edinburgh um, and then became a nonconformist minister in Morpeth. And he there, from there, he compiled an extraordinary Britannia Romana, which is about the whole of Roman Britain and includes. A, a great collection of the known inscriptions from Roman Britain. I mean, he was using other scholars at the time and other antiquarians, but it's still a remarkable source. And later on, I'll show an example of one of his maps, which illustrate the Britannia Romana. It's a really exceptional work. And Horsley, Horsley and the other man on the right, Hodgson, those are the two, two most important, both of whom were clergymen, although Hodgson was an Anglican, uh, Horsley was a nonconformist, um, but they were critical uh, of developing a, a scholarly understanding of the wall. Uh, the illustration in the middle of, is, of course, every every wall walker's favourite, who's William Hutton, who walked at the age of seventy-eight from Birmingham 
to visit Hadrian's Wall and left the count of it. Uh, he, we uh, today admire the landscapes, the sort of landscapes that Peter's shown and I've shown. Hutton thought it was horrid, but he was fascinated by the antiquities. And that was enough. So Camden, Horsley, Hodgson, um, three greats in our understanding of the development and the history of Hadrian's Wall. By the mid 19th century, uh, Hodgson died um, in, in 18, uh, just after 1840. Um, and uh, there was a real interest in the wall, and this was, was developed in particular by a man called John Collingwood Bruce, who I'll, I'll show you an image of shortly. But this, is, this dates from the 1850s, and it's part of a series of murals in the Central Hall at Wallington in Northumberland, now a National Trust uh, managed house. Um, and there are a whole sequence. This is the earliest one of the history of Northumberland, right up to the contemporary period marvellous illustration of, of industry and, 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 and artifice. Um, but here you can see this, I think, really ex extraordinary uh, um, representation of the construction of the building of the wall. Now, on the top of it, and I hope, um, I, how do I get, I don't know how I get rid of my, uh, I don't know, if, anyway, right, right. on the top, I hope you can see it, but I, I rather suspect my the, the screen at the top is, 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 is masking it, is a text in Latin, which basically says, Hadrian constructed a wall um, to divide the Romans from the barbarians. This is one of our key sources, which tell us that Hadrian built the wall. Because in the time of Horsley um, and others, there are a number of different Roman texts, some early, some a little later, which in many ways are contradictory and talk about Agricola. They talk about, potentially they talk about Hadrian. They also talk about Septimius Severus. And so throughout the 19th century, there was a real controversy um, and an argument about who had constructed the Roman wall. Um, and it's interesting here that at Wallington, they put up this text. It's a fourth century text, which attributes the building of the wall to Hadrian because that's exactly what John Hodgson had been arguing for. Hodgson himself wrote about Hadrian's Wall, and one of the reasons people didn't take it quite as seriously, you can't, you can't actually take a book from a shelf, and this is Hodgson's account of the Roman Wall. What you have to do is you have to take his volume on, the, on Southwest Northumberland in the history of Northumberland, which he wrote, and incidentally, because of Hodgson's work, there is no Victoria County history of Northumberland, but I'll set that one aside. Um, so Hodgson, um, from his rural parish, created this history of Northumberland in several volumes. He then uh, decided to write about Hadrian's Wall, and it's a footnote, which is 176 pages long. So it's a slightly, you know, slightly obscure way of trying to present your views. And it is a remarkable view. Uh, because within Hodgson's account of the Roman Wall, he also um, presents a whole range of comparative walls, including the Great Wall of China and a whole, a whole bunch of walls from the Mediterranean Greek world. And, and in his account, he, what was, how did Hodgson see the purpose of Hadrian's Wall or the Roman Wall? It was against the poor and predatory neighbours. Now, in this image by the Scots painter, William Bell Scott, um, uh, you can see the line of the wall running over the, over the crags. That's Crag Luff. Um, and here you can see a whole series of um, sort of uh, um, <clears throat> irritated um, natives. And these are Romans or, or, or Masons defending themselves. I've never quite understood what this lady's doing here, um, but these figures are actually quite significant. Um, because the person on the left, the, the sort of military tribune, rather grand, is actually modelled on a Northumberland landowner called John Clayton, who owned this part of Hadrian's Wall and was instrumental in its clearance and preservation. And at his feet 
is the figure with a very sharp profile of John Collingwood Bruce. And it was Collingwood Bruce who had a name in, in the 19th century as the great expounder um, who, who promoted and wrote extensively about the war. He wrote small books, something called the wallet book or the handbook to the Roman War, which is like a guidebook going from east to west along the line of the wall. And he also wrote huge compendium of books, both of inscriptions and other works. Um, um, and then we have the third element of this conflict and resistance. And at the time, I think this represents what was the war for. It, there was the text, which we've seen, or which we haven't seen, I don't think, from the Roman text, which talks about Hadrian having built it to divide. We have Hodgson's idea that it was to keep out the predatory neighbors. Um, but the, the image that we see here is one of conflict. And I think conflict was certainly on the minds of the 19th century interpreters of Hadrian's Wall. Now the wall that John Clayton owned, uh, which is basically he owned Housted's Fort uh, and he owned uh, extensive lengths of the wall, was um, dug out and partly, only partly uh, restored. And this is a length of the Clayton Wall from more or less the same position as that painting was, was taken. So this is up on Hotbank Crags, uh, looking across to Crag Lough, and beyond that, along to Steel Ring. So this is a later view of John Collingwood Bruce on the left, um, with a, a spectacular um, um, carving, which comes from Housesteads of a victory. Um, and on the right, you can see both a painting of John Clayton and also a view of John Clayton on another section of wall, which his workmen had cleared and partly restored. Um, so Clayton owned forts. He owned Vindolanda Fort, he owned Housted's Fort, um, and he initiated excavations at forts, at bar castles, and along the line of the wall. To some extent, of course, this was destructive because there was relatively little record. Although Clayton did say, while I dig, uh, Collingwood Bruce writes. Um, so Collingwood Bruce did actually try to at attempt to, to make a record of many of the findings which Clayton's men and he himself was able to uh, begin. Um, and this is a view, this is a view from the handbook of the Roman Wall, the top right. And there's Collingwood Bruce at the first, the second pilgrimage of the Roman Wall, and there are annual, sorry, decennial pilgrimages of the Roman Wall. Um, they're now on the ninth year of the decade. So the next one will be in um, uh, 2000, uh, 2029. The last was in 2019. Um, and uh, Collingwood Bruce also uh, promoted the war uh, by asking, the, the, by requiring the Richardson brothers to make um, war, um, uh, watercolors. And this is a view of Mark Castle 39, which Peter showed in that earlier um, view of a Mar castle. And this is a view, the bottom one is a view of the Valum, uh, the great ditch which ran behind the wall. Towards the end of the 19th century, we move into a new era. We see the involvement of the universities. Uh, it's Oxford rather than Cambridge. Um, Francis Haverfield, who was professor of ancient history at Oxford, became very interested in the Roman wall and promoted uh, a sort of promoted and um, organized um, excavations. And the Society of Antiquities of Newcastle, which was founded in 1813, um, also was, was very active. Um, and these are the excavations carried out by a young uh, graduate of Oxford, um, R.C. Bosenkett, who went on to be professor of archeology span at Liverpool and director of the British School at Athens as a classical archeologist. But he was the first person on the wall to excavate the Roman fort. Um, and so that was the period really between about um, the, the late 1890s um, up until the First World War. Um, before the First World War, a person who's both on, in the photograph on the left is the bald headed man at the centre. Uh, and uh, his name is F.G. Simpson. He carried out um, excavations, which I'll refer back to, um, for the Clayton estate. John Clayton was, had died, 
but his estate wanted to retain um, the archaeological remains um, of their um, relative. Uh, and so um, Simpson was not employed, but was allowed to oversee archaeological works on the wall. He, he had a, an income of a private income and he was able to maintain himself. Um, but he was he was a bit he was described at the time as a bit like a um, an, an archaeological land agent, um, and that was before uh, the First World War. And then he became really involved with a new range of scholars, particularly Eric Burley in, in Richmond, Eric Burley at Durham, and then in Richmond at Newcastle, which was at that stage part of Durham, it was King's King's College, Durham, um, and. Advising them, a more senior figure was R.G. Collingwood, who was a professor um, at Oxford and who is well known as a philosopher at the same time. Um, and, but he was also an ancient historian uh, and was very interested as an archaeologist. Um, and so a series of quite structured new research projects were concerned, concerned with the understanding of the wall and also the understanding of some of the wall forts. And this is excavations in 1820, um, 1929 at Bird Oswald on the left. Um, and to get an idea of the sort of intellectual sort of energy that went into the investigation of the wall in the 1920s and 1930s, these are quotations from Ian Richmond, who was at Newcastle. Um, the wall question indeed moves so fast as to excite the mirth, even of those who work upon it. And the excavation published in these pages, the Archaeologia Aeliana, which is the, the journal of the Newcastle Society of Antiquaries, now show that not only the wall, but its forts were modified during the building. And then he says of work at Halton Chester's, which I'll come on to just say a little bit about, an afterthought in the same design, not an afterthought of someone new to the work. So there was a real uh, concern to try and use the archaeological evidence, the structural remains, in order to create and fill out the narrative of the construction of the wall, of how the Hadrian's Wall had been put together in the time of Hadrian. And there was great emphasis then, and there still remains huge emphasis amongst those scholars who are concerned with Hadrian's Wall, very much for that relatively brief period of time, between the period when Hadrian visited Britain, um, the wall was started construction, and then the wall was uh, in, in a series of a sequence of phases the, the actual plan of the wall change and so on. But let's just look at the plan which Simpson and Richmond produced of this fort at Halton Chester's. This fort lies to the north of Corbridge, uh, which remember was the, the only significant town, certainly in the eastern part of, of, of the Roman frontier zone. The other Roman town was at Carlisle. Um, the fort here lies, as I've already mentioned, a little to the east of the main road running from Corbridge up into towards Scotland, the, the Deer Street or, or the A68. And here you can see the outline of the fort, at the line of the wall, which underlies, part of it underlies the main road, one of the main roads, which is running east-west, which is known as the military road, not to be confused with the military way, which is the, the Roman road. Now, significantly, that military road, which was constructed in the 1750s, used the foundations of Hadrian's Wall as the basis for the road. It followed the line of Hadrian's Wall from Newcastle up the Westgate Road, and we shall see traces of that in a little while, and then continued across much of North London until it comes up to the crags. The crags were housed in Zion, and where those crags crags, which I've already shown you. And then the military road runs back to the south. So the wall and the military road diverge. But at this point, uh, the wall is underneath the military road. So when there was building works required on the road, then it was possible to carry out excavations. So this is an instance of um, excavations associated with contemporary infrastructure projects. And we'll return to that. What did they find? They were able to trace the outline of the fort and as you can see, unlike the fort at Housesteads, which we've already seen, here part of the fort is beyond the wall and part of the fort is to the south of it. They were also able to identify the line of the Great Ditch to the south, which is we call the Vallum. Um, and so 
We also see here the fact that the fort has gateways on the outside of the wall, one here, one here, and another one to north. In other words, three gates. And it's, I think, quite reasonably understood that this initial plan for the situation of the forts was intending the forts to be essentially offensive. It's so the garrison could get out. It's not so they could so much defend themselves. Now, if we look at um, this particular photograph, um, here you can see uh, something of the of complexity which they actually discovered. This is the gate tower. Here is the east gate. There is the line of the wall. So they, it's outside of the line of the wall. Um, but in practice, um, they had to build massive foundations, much more massive than they would normally build for a gate, because it was actually on the line, pre-existing line of the wall ditch. In other words, these excavations and other excavations along the line were able to demonstrate the, the process, the major phases of construction, first of the wall to wall, then the ditch, then the turrets and mile castles, and then the construction of the forts across the wall. So, and then thirdly, you can see how the, the vallum seems to divert away from the line of the fort, which indicates that the vallum itself is a third element. So we can see a sequence of the construction, the wall, the forts are then added onto the line of the wall, and in some places overlie pre-existing structures like turrets, not in this case, but in other cases. The forts are situated about every sort of eight or nine miles apart. Um, and then the mile castles and turrets, which we'll see shortly, are every mile and third of a mile. So we have the wall, and remember in the western part, initially, the wall was constructed of turf, and um, a sort of turf, uh, but, but not stone, and then it was replaced in stone. And this is a reconstruction of the wall by Alan Sorrell, the great reconstruction artist of the 1950s. Um, and importantly, uh, it identifies, here you can see the system as was elucidated. Turrets and mile castles had been recognized, obviously in the 19th century, but the whole system really didn't, wasn't properly fully understood until the beginning of the 20th century, with R.G. Collingwood and then with the work of Simpson, Richmond and Burley. Um, um, I'd only say here that obviously this is foreshortened by the um, by the artist. This is a much it's a much longer distance, as you can see from this slide, because here you can see these are the actual locations of the turrets. This is the tower at Peel Gap. This is another turret, a mile castle, another mile castle and so forth. So you get some idea. This is the military road military way which runs behind the wall that's the roman road this is the vallum which in this instance is a long way to the south and the military road that 18th century road is there um and then this is the additional tower and this is the map i um promised you of horsley you can see at the detail of this map showing the castles the mile castles um this the photograph is looking north and the map is um on the right hand side so it's the wrong way around but anyway it's, um, I hope you get some idea of the extent of the, the detail which Horsley was able to call up. So how do we understand this evidence that was emerging at the end of the, of the 1930s? Um, Richmond saw it potentially in conflict terms. As we shall see, there is much evidence in the developing design of the works that their construction was bitterly resented because of the iron frontier control which they imposed. Um, and of course, that's, I think, strongly influenced by Churchill's word so he, the year before when he talked about the Iron Curtain. Um, this is a remarkable um, uh, air photograph um, or drone photograph, which Don Reed published in his new book called The Eagle and the Bear, which is a history of Roman Scotland published last year. I'd recommend it. Um, but this is a view of Housesteads. And Housesteads fought... Um, as I've already mentioned, lies behind the wall, unlike Halton Chester's. But here you can see all the traces of fields, structures of different periods. Some are medieval, some are Roman. Um, there's not time to go into all of them. Uh, but the, the situation of houses is quite spectacular in terms of its preservation. This is an English heritage reconstruction. And what I want to, to stress is this area here, the area which is known as the Vicus, which is the civil settlement. So on the one hand, scholars like Richmond 
were stressing the, the military role of the war. Whereas Eric Burley at Durham um, was stressing, uh, he had excavated here, uh, this is, these are his excavations on the left, and this is a reconstruction drawing of how the Vicus of the South Gate, there you can see the South Gate there, um, by Alan Sorrell's son, Richard Sorrell, um, and that's the name Viki, that's the, the name, it means the sort of, in other words, it has a status which is separate from the fort. And the people who lived in the Viki were probably the, um, maybe members of the soldiers' families, we're not sure, um, certainly um, merchants and others, um, a whole range of people who were not part of the, directly part of the garrison. But early then presented a view um, was that the wall itself was simply a control point, and the fact that there was a, a gateway through the wall at Hustedes at the Nagburn, which I've pointed out. If I go back, the Nagburn is is just up here uh, in the valley beyond, and I think he was possibly influenced by evidence from Roman Germany. At the time of Hadrian, um, a palisade, a timber palisade, was constructed, sort of really to control movement, uh, with a series of watchtowers, and then later on. Uh, it was replaced by a, a stone wall, as you can see there, but it was a, a narrow stone wall. It was never a stone wall where, which you could stand on the top of. Well, you could you could stand on the top of it, but it wouldn't do you much good. Uh, and it's interesting that this place at Dalkingen, there's clearly a an, an opening through the wall to which people could come to and fro. And this is, I think, what is reflected in this English heritage reconstruction of the Nangburn Gate. Um, so, in other words, this view, thinking in terms of the civil settlements and also of the wall as a controlling fire, sees the wall essentially as a porous frontier, a means of, of frontier control, but not necessarily a frontier protection. It isn't actually a barrier. Um, it's more of a, a structure. So what can we learn from the wall itself? Well, we've seen what Clayton did to Hadrian's wall. Um, in terms of the restoration of part of the war and preservation of the wall. But throughout the 1930s and particularly in the 1950s and 60s, teams of workmen working for the Ministry of Works, later on the DOE, the English Heritage, cleared the wall and then consolidated, as you can see on the western, um, western way out of Newcastle. In other words, the wall is held together with modern... The Romes are all... The stones are all... Roman, but the material itself is is not Roman. It's modern um, mortar, modern mortar-based cement, um, cement-based mortar. So, how do we learn about the wall? Well, I think the change came in the nineteen eighties. And on the left, you can see my excavations uh, at Sycamore Gap, that lamented tree which um, was savagely and brutally um, cut down last autumn, and excavations by Paul Bidwell and his team. Uh, in the western Newcastle bypass. I'll say something about my excavations, first of all. Um, this is a view of the wall uh, on High Shield Crags, but what's important here is that you can see there are actually two phases. This high wall here is, this is Roman mortar, very hard, uh, very um, resi resilient mortar, and there's no mortar here, and you can see one is, this is over that and this represents the earlier narrow wall this represents the uh, later restoration of that narrow wall um, and then going down the tracks you can see that there isn't just one wall there are the remains of in fact three walls there's the a broad wall a narrow wall and then this reconstructed extra narrow wall um, and then it became even more um, varied um, in some one place we found the foundations of the broad wall were different from the line of the narrow wall as constructed. And this is on a hill uh, just to the east of Mark Castle 39. And then if we go to Peel Gap further on to the west, we can get some idea of all this sequence of wall building of changing and so forth. We have broad foundation, which dates probably to around about 122 plus within a couple of years, I would guess, of the initial construction of the wall, um, possibly less. Uh, then the construct, the building of that wall to its full height as a narrow wall, that's again Hadrianic through here. That then is 
um, and then later on that a tower is constructed behind it and it's not part of the original sequence of turrets it's it's an additional one and when we were reviewing the pottery quite recently we we were able to work out that in fact it's not constructed until the romans have withdrawn from scotland after they've gone up to scotland to create the antonine wall and then come back after about 158 ad and then they construct this tower and then the tower's demolished and then the the whole of the narrow wall is rebuilt, demolished and rebuilt as an extra narrow wall, probably in around about 208. And the title I gave to this talk, The Greatest Glory of His Reign, is what the same collection of biographies of emperors uh, says Hadrian built a wall. The greatest glory of his reign is not Hadrian, it's actually the emperor Septimius Severus, the emperor who came and campaigned into Northern Scotland with his two um, fractious sons. Not, you know, we know about fractious sons and monarchs. Um, but also, um, and then he also died in Britain um, and so on. But that wall, I'm pretty sure, is the wall of Septimius constructed after 208 in the period uh, of, the, of, of Septimius Severus. So that's the Severan Wall. Now, that's just to give you some insight into the different ways we can look at the wall. And interestingly enough, um, at Warbed, the excavations to the west of Newcastle in the 1980s, they discovered not simply the broad wall with a clay bonded, but also these remarkable remains of early cultivation terraces, which the wall had simply overlaid. And so here we can see their interrelationship for the first time in structural terms between a pre-existing agricultural communities of what we call the late Roman, late pre-Roman Iron Age or the Roman Iron Age um, against with the Roman military structures of the new barrier wall. Now, what then changed in terms of our understanding of the wall, particularly at the, the Eastern end, arose from what used to be termed as a rescue archeology, span but was in fact, um, um, developer-funded archaeology. Here you can see uh, examples of trenches which were um, excavated by Tyndall Weir Museums and other uh, commercial archaeology units, which discovered new traces to the line of the wall. And here you can see um, the, uh, the pits which were discovered. So the line of the wall is over to the right, and these pits are, are, are completely, uh, nobody had suspected these, but of course, if you're just clearing the line of the wall and then restoring it, you're not going to find structures like this. And that's so, but these have only ever been found within the area, essentially from Wall's End in the east, as far as the um, heading on the wall in the west. And they don't extend much, they're, they're not been found any further. And we, for instance, in our excavations at Peel Gap, didn't find any traces of pits like this. So they're a, a, a phenomenon of the eastern end of Hadrian's Wall. This is how they emerge when they're, if you reconstruct it. This is um, Bidwell and, and, and his colleagues' reconstruction. And there you can see the wall. These are the pits in front of the wall, and these are the, uh, and how they would have been filled. This is a cross section. And of course, what does this represent in terms of our understanding of the wall? Quite simply, the wall seems to have a much more protective, defensive character. So on the one hand, we see the wall as being sort of simple barrier to control movement, but here a much more defensive feature. Now, whether it was potentially possible to, it was ever intended to defend the line of the wall like a castle wall or, or a city wall, I'm not quite convinced. Certainly there are the towers along it at regular intervals. And we. I'm pretty convinced also because of all these stones, uh, which can be reconstructed like this and Bidwell and others have agreed with this, that there was a parapet on the top. So there was a wall walk, a parapet, um, but that seems to be, and that all seems to suggest, therefore, that what we're dealing with is a wall, um, which is essentially um, um, protect, more than just protective, it has some defensive character. It's a barrier against movement. It's probably a barrier, not against a huge, uh, offensive force, but against sort of raiding and, and attempts of, of, of so forth to cross it with relatively small, so low intensity warfare rather than high intensity warfare. 
Now, what I was talking about in terms of the excavations of the wall in the National Trust sector here, within the area of Tyne and Weir, where the wall was excavated, I just want to draw your attention to one other area, which is to the north of Newcastle, excavations in the 2000s by Nick Hodgson and others, which were associated with major new infrastructure projects, large housing, large house buildings, Newcastle Great Park, and also um, open cast mining systems at that time. Um, and here were discovered very, very large um, um, uh, Roman iron age. Now these are not part of, these are not Roman, these are part of the indigenous native populations, the British populations of the region. And they're to the north of Hadrian's Wall. And to give you a comparison in scale, this is one of the fort, this is the fort at Wall's End. So they're actually quite sizable in area. But what's really important about this sequence of excavations, which have all, pub all been published, is that because they were very well funded, and you'll notice, you'll think about the difference change from the, you know, the, the private enterprise, the, 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 uh, the local societies in the 19th and early 20th century, the academic involvement, and there is still an academic involvement, the uh, academic involvement in the interwar period, um, and then in particular, the use of commercial archeology span with really extensive funding. And for sites like these, these native sites, the one at Blagden uh, and West Brunton, they were able to take radiocarbon dates because for Roman forts, you have ceramics and inscriptions, but for these sites, you have very little dating evidence, independent dating evidence, but radiocarbon dating evidence is very important and can give us a key clue to when these places are occupied. And what is clear is that these sites were abandoned more or less at the same time as Hadrian's Wall was constructed. So whether it was quite deliberate clearance of a population in front of the wall, to the north of the wall, or whether these peoples no longer felt protected by Rome and therefore they abandoned because of the peoples to the north, we can't be sure. But there is this very significant change in population at about that time. I'll say a little bit more and then I think I might have to draw to close because I think time is running out. I want to just say something about the people on the wall. Um, this is um, a, a reconstruction of the settlement outside the Roman fort at Chester's at the crossing of the North Tyne. And this is the place where uh, a cavalry unit and a cavalryman is shown on the left-hand side. Now, we've learned a great deal about the plan of these settlements outside of the forts. This is at Maryport on the Cumberland coast. Um, from geophysical surveys, and there have been new excavations. There are excavations continuing now at Bird Oswald with uh, Historic England and Newcastle University, and before that at Maryport. Um, but when we think about these peoples, um, I just say to recent views, the dichotomy in the nature of the contested landscape and yet at the same time, there is an inclusivity about the material culture. In other words, there is Roman material out with the forts and outside to some extent, and also um, the peoples themselves. And there's also, um, there was, a, it's no longer quite, so, shall I say, fashionable, the, the nature of multiculturalism. And I just show one example of that. Um, um, at South Shields, the, at the Asda car park, you can see this reconstruction of a Roman altar, uh, sorry, a Roman tombstone. And the Roman tombstone, which is in the museum at South Shields, is to a lady called Regina, who came from Southeast England, um, from the tribe of the Atavaloni, um, who was married to a man called Barates, who came from Palmyra, which of course is in Syria, and was savagely destroyed, partly savagely destroyed by ISIS. Um, a few years ago. Um, but here you can see some Palmyrene inscriptions. And that just shows you something of the multiculturalism. Th thank you, Jim, for a, a, a fascinating and in-depth talk. Um, we've got some uh, a wide selection of questions. Uh, I'll, I'll cherry pick a few. Um, can you give any, any sense of how many soldiers were manning the wall uh, at one particular time? Um, well, the estimates by... by... Uh, Breeze and Dobson in their excellent book on Hadrian's Wall um, is that there were 7,800 and 
sorry, 7,986 soldiers on the wall itself. And if you include the Cumberland coast, it goes up to 9,090. Um, so, and, yeah. And do we um, have a clear picture of where they came from? And also, uh, were they on a limited tour of duty or were they posted there for an extended it time? Depends, it depends whether you were an officer or, 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 or another rank. If you were another rank, uh, your unit could stay there for the whole period of your service, which would be 22 years. Um, if you were an officer, um, you would only be in post for about three years and then you would move somewhere else. Um, so the, the tribunes um, or prefects, there were variously tribunes and prefects, who came from the equestrian order in Rome, they, they, they served three, three to four years and then they moved somewhere else. Um, whereas the, the soldiers, if your unit moved, then you would move, but otherwise they, they didn't move. The soldiers did retire because they were given diplomas. Um, th th they were given a, 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 a bronze diploma, and these survive in, in various parts of the, of the Roman world. So they, they did survive. And of course, when they retired, they gained Roman citizenship because the soldiers who were on Hadrian's Wall were not Roman citizens. They were recruited from the, the subject peoples of the Roman world. Um, and the people, the the, the garrisons on Hadrian's Wall mainly come from from Europe, I mean Western Europe, or sort of Gaul, um, some from Spain, but others, uh, for instance, the Dacians at uh, Bird Oswald would have come originally, the unit would have been raised in Dacia, which is Romania. One of the questions, the big question is, um, is how far the there was continuing recruitment from these more distant places, it was generally assumed that uh, that over time the units would just become uh, sort of localized. Um, but there is some evidence to suggest that there was still they were still recruiting. For instance, at Housesteads, we found um, we found um, we, we found pottery which had names which were quite clearly Germanic, and would suggest those people were coming outside of the Roman world. Oh, was, yeah, outside of Rome. One of the participants asks, um, do we know if Hadrian visited the site of the wall personally and did he personally authorise its construction? As far as we, 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 we don't have Hadrian's footprints, but um, we're pretty, it's, it's the scale of the project and the very, in, in many ways, the, the particular nature of it suggests that Hadrian had, a, had a, a, an involvement, certainly in the first phases of the construction of the wall, yes. Um, I think he must have been, I mean, it's it's ironical that we have this remarkable monument, but we have very few written sources relating to it. Um, you know, a little earlier, Tacitus was, well, Tacitus was more or less contemporary with Hadrian, but he was writing about earlier times. And we don't have very good sources for the period from Trajan onwards. Um, we have these odd biographies which were um, put together in the fourth century, uh, which most of the quotations I use come from. So it's it's sometimes it's inference and anecdote rather than than narrative history. Is is there any estimate of the financial cost to Rome? <laughs> um, yeah, hello, is Mr. Street. It's it's very difficult. I mean, there is a there is a a, a significant. Um, uh, discipline now, which is called energetic, en energetics, which is a way of trying to estimate in real terms what these major projects, um, what they represented in terms of manpower and resources. But what it, what's difficult is then to to put that into 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 denarii or solidi or whatever you know. Um, it's 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 very you know we can say we can give a good estimate of the manpower required i'm not sure that it's been done yet for hadrian's war but for other projects um i was i was looking at one recently which has been done for the land wall the, the land side wall of london it's a really there's a really good article on that published three years ago but so we can estimate um, the the quanti the man hours and so forth and what this represents in terms of foodstuffs and so, but we can't really make. And and with Hadrian's Wall, for instance, 
uh, we have this problem that um, you know if the the soldiers were always be being paid, you had to feed them. If they if the legions were actually doing most of the work, how much does this actually add additional cost to the Romans? So one of the questions that's come in through the chat in the eastern part, why didn't the Romans build the wall along the Tyne rather than building it further to the north? Um, why not along the Tyne? Well, I think it it it, it occupies a, a actually a, a tactically stronger position um, to the north of the Tyne. I mean, one of the complicated, I, I don't want to get involved in the sort of the minutiae of the arguments, but one of the problems, for instance, with this notion of the stain gate is that the stain gate in the west is actually to the south of, is to the south of the River Erning, so Irving. So there's actually a river between the stain gate frontier and the garrisons on the wall. But, you know, there are problems. But for the, for the east side, no, I think it's not, the, the, it's beyond the time, yeah. And do we know if there was a walkway along the top of the wall, um, either for the full length or part of it? I think that's what I was trying to suggest. I was rushing a bit there, but where we get these particular stones, I mean, the wall is certainly wide enough. People keep on saying it, it's not very wide. And I've been to lots of castle walls, which are significantly narrower, much more hazardous. Um, health and safety wasn't the key issue in the Roman army. Um, I mean, the wall was at least six feet or, you know, meet, just under two metres wide. And if the parapet was, you know, let's say 30 centimetres, 40 centimetres, that gives you quite a lot of room. And the wall itself would have been about 15 feet, um, you know, maximum five metres high. OK. So, yeah, I, it could have been walked upon. Yeah. Great. I think two, two more questions. Um, how important was the war, given that most trade and long distance travel was presumably by the by sea? Well, it's an interesting question that, but I was actually reading some papers recently, which suggested that, for instance, for the uh, movement of ceramics, um, you know, m m the, the Roman army was a great consumer. And one of the key issues about Hadrian's Wall is it was a great area of consumption of goods from outside, whether it's uh, whether it's olive oil or whether it's wine or whether it's uh, you know smart shiny po red pottery from from France. Um, but the this paper, who was which was uh, the experts on on Seminware, was saying that the material was actually carried up by land transport from York, and it came into York by sea, and then from land transport from York. So um, the sea transport is important, but it's actually constrained in some senses by the times of the year. And yet at the same time, we have South Shields, which is clearly has a, has a must have had a, a, a significant harbor. And we also know that South Shields itself was a, a campaign base for the campaigns. So sea transport is important, but I don't think that the, the the wall itself doesn't doesn't say that there's any reason why you should you know they 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 they, they don't conflict in, in themselves they're not they're not contradictory shall we say thank you jim and and final question what secrets does the wall still hold for the future well i think it's interesting i think one of the one of the problems that we face unlike certain other areas of archaeology in britain is that because the 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 practice of burial was cremation for much of the period of the Roman, the Roman army occupation. We have cremation burials, and we only have relatively few of those who should have been investigated. Um, so unlike the Anglo-Saxon, the early Anglo-Saxon period, where we have lots of cemeteries and lots of bones, we don't have lots of bones of Roman, dead Romans, certainly not in the north. So we can't do the clever stuff you can do with DNA and stable isotope and so forth. Uh, a little bit has been done, but one would like to see more of that line. So I, I think that would be very interesting. It would, it would, um, I, I wouldn't say it would confirm, but it would, would tell another story as well as the story that the inscriptions and the written sources tell us. 